Welcome back, and thank you for joining me for episode two of our Spine Talk on the subject of spondylolisthesis. My name is Brett Friedman, and I'm an orthopedic spine surgeon at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. In this episode, we'll discuss how common spondylolisthesis is. Lytic spondylolisthesis is the most common cause of slippage of the spine in young adults and children. Unlike degenerative spondylolisthesis, it's more common in men than in women. This process starts with a crack in the pars called a spondylolysis. This crack almost always occurs in childhood or in adolescence. So if you're going to get this condition, you will usually have it by adulthood. About five to six percent of adults in the U.S. have spondylolysis. In the 2010 census, there were 235 million adult Americans. So that means about 12 to 14 million adults have this anatomic finding. Since we perform well under 30,000 surgeries per year for lytic spondylolisthesis, or put another way, since less than two in 1,000 people with this condition will undergo surgery, obviously the vast majority of people with lytic spondylolisthesis or any form of spondylolisthesis do not need surgery, and most will remain asymptomatic or so minimally bothered by their spondylolisthesis that they never seek medical attention and they never know that they have a slip. It has some hereditary nature. The rate of spondylolysis in a first degree relative is about three to four times higher than the general population. But that said, most cases are sporadic. They'll just happen. Not all people with lysis go on to slip. The published rates vary from one in three to two in three or more that progress from a simple PARS defect to a spondylolisthesis. Some activities seem to increase the risk of spondylolysis and lysthesis. These activities all share forced extension of the lumbar spine as a common feature. For instance, gymnasts performing arches or linemen in football blocking each other. Most lysis occurs within the first five to six years of life and is completely asymptomatic. Some can occur in adolescence or later. Those that occur later often are associated with activity and produce pain. When an acute PARS defect is detected, bracing can be used to try and get the bones to heal. Your, if your teenager is compliant with brace wear and activity limitations, which last for three to six months, healing rates can be as high as 80 to 90%. When non-operative treatment is unsuccessful, surgery to repair the crack or fuse the spine can be performed. Unlike lytic spondylolisthesis, degenerative spondylolisthesis takes decades to develop. It is present in about 12% of people aged 40 to 65, but this increases to 30% in people over the age of 65. Most slips do not progress more than one grade, which is to say if you're diagnosed with a degenerative spondylolisthesis, it's not likely that the amount that the spine has slipped will increase substantially over the rest of your life. However, the degeneration of the spine will continue, and this can lead to progressive narrowing termed spinal stenosis, which can turn a minimally symptomatic spondylolisthesis into a debilitating one. For this reason, it becomes more important, in my opinion, to listen to your body sooner when you have a degenerative slip, as opposed to a lytic type. I say this because this type of slip becomes symptomatic later in life. If it prevents you from enjoying a reasonable quality of life, and as a result you exercise less, and your overall health diminishes, Surgeries to correct this problem only become more challenging and more complicated. Further, general medical problems are more common and more significant as we age. Likewise, most of these surgeries rely on the quality of your bone to achieve good technical outcomes. The same folks that develop degenerative spondylolisthesis, for instance, postmenopausal women, tend to be the ones who are developing osteoporosis. And osteoporosis significantly increases the risk of complication when spinal fusion is performed. So I believe there's a time in your life when surgery for spondylolisthesis may be more effective and perform more safely. Because of this, if your condition rises to the level for which surgery is recommended, then you and your surgeon should discuss the benefits of performing surgery at that point in your life versus delaying surgery further. While I personally think that patients with degenerative spondylolisthesis that has failed to respond to non-operative treatment can achieve a better overall outcome, 
if we perform surgery sooner than later, patients well into their 80s can still have excellent results from this type of surgery. Fortunately, the challenging decision of when to have surgery for a slip is something that should only be faced by a small percentage of people with this condition. In fact, the most important take-home message from this episode is that spondylolisthesis is a rather common abnormality of the spine and that the vast majority of slips are clinically silent for your entire life. They're either found accidentally when you're getting an x-ray or a CT scan for some other reason. So incidentally, learning you have a slip does not mean you need to be worried about your spine health. If you incidentally find that you have spondylolisthesis, then you need only do what we all should do, which is lead a spine-healthy lifestyle. Remember that essentially all people will have at least one significant episode of low back pain in their life. So if you have one, and this is when your spondylolisthesis is detected, that does not mean that your back pain is due to the spondylolisthesis. It just means that you have back pain and you have a slip. If you have recurrent episodes of low back pain, and especially if you develop symptoms that radiate into one or both legs, then there's a stronger case for assuming there's a causal relationship between the slippage and the symptoms you're experiencing. When a causal relationship is suspected, then you should pursue treatment for your spondylolisthesis. The first line treatment for spondylolisthesis is the same as for essentially all spinal conditions, and that is non-operative care. This revolves around living a spine-healthy lifestyle. When this is not enough, the medications, therapies, and eventually spinal injections can be trialed. In cases that fail to respond to these common forms of non-operative care, then a surgical referral to discuss the option of surgery becomes appropriate. Now that we've discussed what spondylolisthesis is and how common it is, I hope you'll join us for episode three in this series, in which we'll describe the symptoms of spondylolisthesis and how the condition is diagnosed. Again, I'm Dr. Brett Friedman of the Mayo Clinic, Department of Orthopedic Surgery, and it's been a pleasure spending this time together with you. I really appreciate your willingness to listen to this spine talk. If after reviewing all the episodes in this series, you have additional questions or would like to request an appointment to be seen at the Mayo Clinic for your spinal condition, please use the information displayed on the screen to contact us. Thank you and be well.